Hey friends, you can probably hear it in my voice, but I'm getting sick. And to be honest, I'm kind of freaking out. I joke a lot about people unwittingly catching the gay or the trans, and I'm actually worried that I may have caught the straight or the cis. I have a few symptoms that are really worrying me. Um, thinking about helping plan a gender reveal party for a pregnant friend, um, starting to like glitter a lot less than I used to, and my flannel shirts haven't left my closet for days. I'm pretty scared, friends. Why isn't there a vaccine for this? Anyways, that's what the Patreon money's going for this week. We need to find the straight cis vaccine right now. I don't want anyone else going through what I'm going through. Jason and Casey got us started this week, so thank you, friends. To find out more about how you can help in this vital research, head over to patreon.com slash Manifesto. Your source for news, commentary, discussion, and debate at the intersection of the atheist movement and the LGBT rights movement, this is The Atheist Manifesto. Hello and welcome to the Gaithy's Manifesto. I am your host, Callie Wright, joined once again by my fabulous co-host, Ari Stillman. What's up, Ari? Um, insert witty quip here. That's how I'm doing, Callie. How are you? Oh. <laughs> well, that, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> Our guest this week is Nell Gaither. She is the president of the Trans Pride Initiative, and their organization does all kinds of great work to help trans folks. But the issue we're focusing on today is the incarceration of transgender people and the unique issues that trans people face in prisons and jails. Uh, quick thing up top, given the subject of conversation, uh, obviously going to be talking about some pretty tough things, violence, sexual assault, and the like. So if you're in a sensitive place, that is something to be aware of. So Nell, welcome to the show. Thank you. And uh, thank you for allowing this topic. Uh, this topic is something that's often overlooked, and I'm really happy to be able to, to discuss it. Yeah, thanks for having this. It's something that I've been thinking on for a while. And uh, yeah, so I'm, 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 I'm excited to talk about this. And well, excited is probably the wrong word because it's pretty, a pretty right. bleak subject, but <laughs> I'm sure you know what I mean. It <laughs> so, must be done. So, uh, so if you could start off by just giving us a little background, tell us about uh, the, the work that you do surrounding uh, incarcerated trans folks. Okay. Uh, we we do work in several different areas, but in the incarceration area, what we basically do is respond to written requests for assistance. So somebody will write to us about an issue that they are having. Uh, we figure out if it's something we can help with. If so, do we have enough information or do we need more information, either from the incarcerated person or from doing some research? And then we try to get the problem addressed. So that's basically what we do. Uh, the types of problems we deal with can have a wide range from like low urgency items, such as providing information around health care, uh, getting somebody moved closer to family to kind of moderate urgency issues like addressing harassment or unjustified use of force to more emergency situations like health care emergencies and, and threats against someone's life. And do we have a sense of how many people we're talking about? Like, I, I imagine with lots of things trans related, it's probably difficult to know for sure, because you know, I'm guessing those statistics aren't reported. And uh, a lot of people aren't reported correctly as far as their gender and their names and their pronouns and all of that kind of stuff. But I mean, do you have a sense of, of exactly how many people we're talking about that are affected by this kind of thing? We do somewhat. Um you know, I had a conversation uh, uh, maybe two years ago with the person who's kind of in charge of the health care within the, the Texas system. So the Texas, uh, Texas incarcerates currently about 148,000 persons. We're either the top or the second most uh, state with the second the top or second most uh, persons incarcerated. And the person, Dr. Walter Mayer, said, oh, there should only be two or three trans persons in the whole system. Oh, God. So, you know, <laughs> that's using old data. No, that's not right. That was used to deny people access to health care and things. We've been submitting Public Information Act requests to ask them how many people are officially listed in the system. And when we started doing that, uh, Going back to January of 2015, there were about 100 people officially listed. There's now 570. Um, 
if we look at the Bureau of Justice Statistics, uh, and that's just for the Texas system, Bureau of Justice Statistics has given an estimate of about 3,200 trans persons in both state and federal prisons nationwide, and another 1,700 in local facilities. Uh, I don't know, that sounds really too low to me, but that's their current estimate. If you look at the Williams Institute, which gave a nationwide estimate of 0.6% um, of the general, the trans persons are 0.6% of the general population, um, and in Texas it's 0.66%, that would be for um, Texas about 975 trans persons. We think that due to disproportionate effect, um, we probably have a thousand to fifteen hundred just in the state system, not counting local jails. And, and so that is something that's tracked. Like there, there's a thing that will officially designate someone as trans in the system because I, I feel like the. The impression that I get just from the few stories that I've heard is that um, th there's not really a space in between like the system sees you as a man if you have a penis and a woman if you have a vagina, either, you know, natally or surgically, and that there's really nothing in between. So there is sort of an official listing of like this inmate is trans, this inmate's not. Yes, there is in the Texas system. Gotcha. Um, but that doesn't negate that binary operation that people in the system, they deny that they're placing people in, in units by genitalia. And according to PRIA, which we'll get into later, that's not allowed. But um, it very much is. If you have a penis, you are in a man's faci men's facility. If you have a vagina, you're in a woman's facility. We only know of one person um, who is actually in a gender-affirming uh, unit. So it's a trans woman in a women's unit. Wow. Yeah. And where I where I got this and obviously this is just one source of information, but, uh, you know, MSNBC has the that lockup show, which like obviously you never know how accurate those shows are. Like it right. could be sensationalized and that kind of thing. But there was one where they actually had uh, there was a jail that had an LGBT liaison officer, which I thought like the fact that that exists is like, OK, that's that's maybe a start <laughs> somewhere. Um, but she was talking about this trans inmate who was a trans woman and using he him pronouns and basically right. just saying like well yeah we don't see him as a woman because he still has a and i'm just like oh my god what a mess like right. you're the, you're the lgbt liaison like you're supposed to be like and the, you don't get it <laughs> yeah like you're supposed to be the one person in the system who might get it <laughs> right and uh, even where systems do have lgbt liaisons such as uh dallas does uh, so we look at the local unit, but a lot of times having that having that position and having policy can often be used as an excuse to cover up abuses that are ongoing. So that's really problematic where the establishing policy, establishing liaisons really only cover up the abuses. They don't address them. Yeah, I feel like it's a good way to to be able to say that you're doing something about the problem. Like, oh yeah, we know we have LGBT inmates, so we hired this liaison, right. but they don't actually give the person any power or, or create any policy to make things better for those folks. I, I imagine that's probably the situation in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. So as, as far as um, how the people end up uh, in the prison system, um, I know that... Um, there are a lot of correlates with the types of people that tend to end up in prison. For example, poverty, homelessness, mental illness are a few factors that often contribute to that. Are those the same kinds of factors that are leading to trans people being incarcerated? Or are there any sorts of crimes that, if you know of, that, that trans people tend to commit to, in order to end up in prison? Or is it just kind of the same as your general population? As far as I can tell, it's sort of the same as the general population. We work with uh, folks that are uh, in for from things from DW, you know, repeat DWIs or DUIs uh, to robbery, theft, uh, to murder. Uh, it's it kind of crosses the same areas, but I think what you have is um, those types of of poverty influences, racial uh, discrimination, and other things that disproportionately affect the general population are going to be 
uh, accentuated within the trans community because of a lack of access to work and education and and uh, housing and just all the, the gamut of things that trans persons face that puts them at higher risk for incarceration. Yeah, well, because obviously we know, you know, there, there are huge intersections with with race and poverty and being trans. And so, you know, if you're trans, you're more likely to be impoverished, uh, you're, you know, so on and so forth. And so I, I know uh, sex work is a big thing that um, that folks do because, you know, the unemployment is a problem. So uh, so they do sex work, which obviously uh, can can end up with you in prison. And so it, it's just it. <clears throat> In, in my mind, from my understanding, it's just sort of the things that generally put people at risk, uh, put trans people more at risk. Is that is that right. kind of a good way of saying it? Yeah. Yes, I think that's very accurate. And so I, I, I have to imagine, I, I guess maybe I know <laughs> the answer to this, or at least I think I know the answer to this. But I mean, I have to imagine, like, I mean, I mean prisons are pretty terrible places generally. And I have to imagine that it, it's uniquely terrible for trans folks. Can you talk about the ways that, uh, that trans folks are affected uniquely by incarceration? There's, first of all, it's a gender binary in the system, and it is very much based on what genitals you have. And so for trans persons, you have just a daily psychological abuse in the sense that uh, the guards and the, the administration and even in what in Texas is called safe prisons, which is supposed to be the group that, that protects vulnerable populations, will go out of their way to uh, misgender people. So trans women will be called sir and mister, even though they wouldn't normally call other folks in the general population with those terms, they will go out of their way to identify trans persons um, uh, in opposition to their gender identity. Um, there's also within the prison system, anyone who is seen as non-heteronormative oftentimes um, is pretty low on the power kind of um, hierarchy inside the walls. So those persons are more vulnerable to coercion and extortion and uh, coerced sex, sex assault and just being manipulated by the system. Since a lot of trans persons also have lost contact with their family due to being trans or whatever, um, then they can also be even more vulnerable because they're what's called riding solo. They don't have outside support. And so all of those things kind of compound to put you at greater risk. Gotcha. Yeah. And so, so an example of that might be the fact that, you know, a lot of folks in prisons have family who put money on their books so they can buy things for canteen. And uh, so like the, the prison store, they can get snacks and food and drinks and hygiene items and things right. like that. And things that make prison a little bit more comfortable. Right, right. And, and, and I know a lot of those things are used as currency in prisons, too. And so yes. I, I can see that being a huge disadvantage as far as the power dynamic, not having those things where a lot of other people do. Right. Right. Yeah, we work with a lot of people who are indigent in the system. And there was even not long ago somebody who we put money on her books so that she could just get stamps to uh, get letters out to us to stay safe because she was in a complex situation and was actually getting glass and rocks in her food. And her, she had no money on her book. So we put some money on there, but they took it all. So even, you know, when somebody does deposit money on your books, sometimes if you've been manipulated by the system, you can get into a situation where it's even difficult to dig out of that hole where you can actually keep the money on your books. So that also encourages trading within the system. So people will do anything from, uh, draw greeting and make greeting cards for people and sell those to trading sex for, um, for little small comforts and protection. Gotcha. And, and are, are there any stories from folks that you've heard that stand out as sort of illustrations of these problems? Well, um, I was going to kind of tell a story about somebody we worked with for several years now. Mm -hmm. Um, 
if you'd like me to do that, it's kind of larger than the prison system. So it kind of shows how the justice system as a whole is stacked against trans persons. Yeah, I think that's super important. Yeah. Okay. Um, her name, I'm just going to call her K for, um, for privacy. Sure. But K is a young Latinx trans woman. She's very attractive. Um, she's from a low income urban background. Uh, she does have a supportive family. So that's unusual. Um, at 19, she had graduated from, from high school and she left home and was studying for licensure in a healthcare profession. She was accused of sexual assault of a minor. Um, she was, since they were, the family was poor, uh, she was provided with a public defender who told her she didn't have a chance at trial because she was trans and it was her word against a minor. So she should take a plea deal. So um, she thought that she was taking a deal for about five years and wound up sentenced at age 21 to two 20-year terms. So she's got at least 20 years in the system now, at eight, starting at age 21. Um, a couple of years later, her accuser recanted. So um, she uh, started trying to do a habeas corpus, which is when somebody recants, you can do a, a habeas corpus to um, try to... Get, have your, your case exonerated. Um, the, but the accuser's family is afraid that the accuser, who's now recanted, would go to prison. Right. Um, if, if they come out as having lied earlier. So it's a poor family, and, and they can't afford attorneys to help them through these things. So it's like they're trying to deal with this on their own. Case family tries to support her by sending in necessary legal paperwork. The prison system actually threatens to cut off their visitation rights for sending in legal paperwork. And that just happens a lot, especially for people who are lower on the hierarchy and the prison system wants to manipulate them. They will find ways like that. Um, in, in Kay's case, we contacted a local judge, and this is somebody I'd worked with, and the judge actually contacted the public defender because uh, this judge said a lot of times public defenders, in a case where the supposed victim recants, the public defender feels like it's an ethical consideration to take on the habeas corpus. Well, it turns out this public defender is, is somebody who is well-known for just running cases through and runs case, uh, around 1,000 public defense cases through a year and will never call anybody back and will never take on things like that. So she's stuck in prison um, trying to do what she can to uh, get her habeas corpus and as a very attractive trans woman in a men's prison, also very young, she's 24 now, I believe, um, She's subject to a lot of violence. So uh, one thing, she tried to get back on her hormones. Um, and at the time she first tried, that included a trip to a psych unit. So we have one person who described that, that trip that they would take to a psych unit as uh, three weeks sitting naked in a cold, permanently lit cell with 2,000 people screaming around you. Jesus. Uh, it's... Yeah, it's a pretty horrible experience. Well, and and, and so why think, were they sent there? I mean, is it just because they're trying to get hormones so the system says you're now mentally ill and need to go? Like, is that how, like, how, I don't understand how that happens. We think that that was being done as kind of a barrier that trans persons who came out asking for hormones were sent to one of the psych units to see, are you really trans enough to make it through this hurdle? Oh, my God. Um, and when we actually talked to the healthcare provider and said, you know, we think it's a pretty bad deal that people are being sent to the psych unit uh, or to the psych units before they can start hormones. And they said, we don't know anything about that. I kind of think that's hard to believe, but it seems to have stopped. So 
this is something we feel like we, through our you know advocacy, we think we've stopped this. Uh, it hasn't happened in a couple of years now, as far as I know. But Kay was one of the persons who couldn't make it through. She gave up after about, I think, 10 days and came back to her unit and gave up on hormones. Um, she... Uh, was she continued to try to face pressure to provide sex um, for oftentimes she'll be manipulated into a situation where they'll say, um, we'll protect you if you'll give us sex. And if you don't provide sex, we'll tell lies to this gang over here that they're going to come and beat you up. It's called getting smashed. So um, that's what they were trying to manipulate her into. At one time she was attacked by five guys and, um, Kay is pretty tough, and she fought him off. Um, but after that, we started trying to get her into what's called safekeeping status, which is the status that um, under PRIA, it's called protective custody, but it's supposed to be a little safer housing. But because she got into the fight and she defended herself, they said, no, you don't, you don't need safekeeping status because you can defend yourself. Um, wow. <laughs> And then also something we see often is whenever you get into a fight, you also get a disciplinary case, which um, can affect your parole uh, eligibility and how you kind of basically live in the system. Because if you get too many disciplinary cases, you get into rougher and rougher situations because your what's called your custody level gets downgraded. So... <laughs> Um, that's just kind of a quick overview of some of the things that work um, to really make things rough. Now, Kay is on hormones now. After the psych unit thing ended, she reapplied for hormones again, and she is now on hormones. She's fairly safe right now and just trying to keep a low profile. But we're still, when we can, trying to get her into that safekeeping housing. And, and I know even... You know, when I was getting into activism, this was something that I only heard sort of murmurs about. And then obviously there was, you know, the Chelsea Manning case, which was super high profile. Mm -hmm. And then there was the CC McDonald case. And I know Janet Mock has spoken out a lot about this. And so like, you know, and those have all been, you know, just within the past few years. So, I mean, are, are you seeing a more heightened interest in, uh, in these com conversations around this issue in, in light of those cases? Are they helping? Are they hurting? Yeah, um, and we also saw, saw like Leslie Feinberg before they passed away, and Laverne Cox and some other people are trying to raise the the, the the raise attention to this. I think that any kind of attention like that is going to help some, but I also feel there's such a strong assumption that folks in prison are essentially disposable that I can't really say it's a heightened interest and in awareness. Um, that, yeah, there's there's some increase, but we don't get a lot of, you know, reaction from people who, you know, want to take up the incarcerated trans person cause, even in the trans community. It's kind of still ignored. So I think it might be more accurate to say that the prison abolition movement is gaining some notice in broad social justice advocacy efforts with kind of broader movement to call out the harms within the, the prison system and the prison industrial complex. And trans activists are getting involved in those organizations. So it's more like trans and queer issues are now acknowledged better within the abolition movement. And I think that's where we're starting to see um, these issues more positively addressed is within that movement. That brings up something that that I was wondering. Um, I, I imagine that at this point in the conversation, we probably have some listeners who are thinking to themselves, yeah, you know, trans people don't deserve to be discriminated against for their trans status. But at the same time, you know, not in the case of Kay, who was innocent of the crime that she was convicted of, but in cases where people actually did commit crimes, they might think, well, they're they're still criminals. You know, they, they still deserve to be in prison. Why should we have any sympathy for, especially for somebody who possibly committed a violent crime that hurt other people. And they might be thinking, why, why should we be working towards 
making life in prison better for bad people who deserve to be in prison and who have hurt others. Like prison's supposed to be a punishment. It's not supposed to be fun. So uh, what, what would you say to people who think that? And why do you think people should be concerned about the treatment of prisoners, whether they're trans or cis? Well, I think there's kind of a standard answer for that, and that's that uh, people are sentenced to their term. They're not sentenced to harassment and coercion and uh, rape and and theft of their money, and they're not sentenced to all these other things that happen disproportionately to trans persons while in prison. One person we work with is Danny. So Danny, um, Danny is a convicted murderer. Um, I believe she's probably committed three murders and she by her own admission says I belong in prison uh, Danny came out when she first wrote to us she said I am not a trans person <laughs> I'm not quite sure what brought this out but she said I'm not a trans person I'm an effeminate gay male and I'm proud of it and by the third letter she says you know I think I'm trans <laughs> <laughs> and she said Help me get on hormones and help me, you know, work through this. And so we've worked with her for a couple of years now. And she's one of my favorite people that we work with. And Danny says that now she used to be quite violent within the prison system. And that was how she protected herself. Once she came out feeling like she was true to who she was, she felt like she did not need to be a fake person anymore and she said you know I'm going to give up being violent to stay safe and I'm going to try to be to do my time better and to put myself in a position to help others and she's done that for the last two years so this is somebody that due to fight spent about 12 years in solitary confinement but those same forces that um, oppress and cause trans persons to be suicidal, to be depressive and anxious, and and to withdraw from society in the world also happen in prison. So we serve our entire society better by treating people humanely. And a lot of these people will get out. And so if we're abusing them while they're in the system, they're not getting in a better position to move forward once they get out. And recidivism is already really high. We can help people by affirming their identity and by um, helping them address how their identity was repressed earlier, then we can help them uh, not continue to do um, social harm activities or what we generally call crimes once they are released. Yeah. And, and I think obviously there's a broader conversation to be had about, you know, prison abolition and whether prison is the right uh, mechanism for addressing these, right. these societal issues in the first place. But I think, exactly. I, I think, even if we accept that, and, and I don't necessarily, I think that's probably a different episode for that entire conversation. But I think even if we accept that 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 prison is the thing to to fix these societal problems, I think at the end of the day, the goal should be to eliminate these harms from society. Right? It, it's not to throw people away when they do bad. It's to it, it's to stop them from doing bad again. Right. Um, Exactly. And I think one one thing that the organization Black and Pink that they really say a lot of times in, in addressing this issue, I'm not defined by my worst mistake or I'm not defined by my mistakes. I'm more than just my mistakes. Well, right. And, and I mean, and there are so many stories that you hear. I mean, there's the story in the news right now about the young girl who was, who was uh, trafficked and uh, eventually yeah. killed the person who was trafficking her. And now she has a life sentence for that. And right. so I, I think the other part of that conversation is to understand that a lot of people who are in prison are in prison for extraordinarily unjust reasons in the first place. Um, right. You know, we, we could have the conversation about the people who are like like yes they are just hurting people and are a net bad to society and and i think there's the assumption that if you're in prison you're automatically one of those people and i think it's important to to sort of disabuse people of that notion in the first place because a lot of times that's just not the case right 
Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And even, you know, we can look at where we do have statistics, such as in Texas, um, if you start breaking down incarceration rates per 100,000 persons, then you see an overall incarceration rate of per 100,000 persons of about 400 to 500, I think. If it's if you just look at whites, then it's around 375. But for uh, black persons, it's around 15 to 1800. So it's like four times the general incarceration rate. And one commenter, a person who used to work at the in within the Texas state system, said, "You don't get to this level of disparity." by having just a faulty justice system. You get to it by having problematic education and employment and housing and social support systems as well. Um, it's, it's much bigger issues that need to be addressed, but just the existence and getting through prison is one area that does um, need attention to. And you talked about PREA earlier, so let's talk about that. PREA is a PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act. And uh, just from some of the reading that I've been doing, I understand that you know if there are policies surrounding trans folks in prisons, that they start from that law and that most states don't even really meet those standards. So can you talk to us about PREA and, and what that's all about? Yeah, PREA is the Prison Rape Elimination Act. And I guess we're in something like the fourth year of PREA audits where the prison system has to kind of check their their uh, units to make sure that they're in compliance. But not all states do 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 the the appropriate compliance. And it I was looking up some data. It looks like as of two thousand and sixteen reporting, about 10 states were certified as compliant. So this has been in effect essentially since 2010. All the, the regulations and stuff didn't go in uh, into effect until later. There's been plenty of time to work up to addressing this issue. Um, there are 42 states and territories, because this, this includes American Samoa and some other uh, locations, um, that are, have made um, assurances that they're working toward PREA compliance. And there are two states, I believe it's maybe Alabama and Utah, that are refuse, still refusing to, uh, to even make an assurance that they're going to comply. They're just opting out of, of PREA compliance. And, and so they're just choosing to pay, because there's a financial penalty, right, if they don't. And so they're just saying, a, we'll just pay the fine, screw it. Yeah, there's a financial penalty, something like 5% of some certain funds. I think it's pretty minimal. It PREA doesn't have a lot of teeth, um, so it's not a big incentive to pay. And I believe that there's been some talk in either D.C. Um, around either the legislature or um, – or, um, the Justice Department about altering regulations to make it even less now. So, oh, wow. yeah, it's not, doesn't look good. Um, um, the protections for trans persons, uh, I don't, I don't really think that, pr that you could say, I don't really think it's too accurate to say that Priya kind of provided, um, a starting point for trans rights in the system. They did help some, uh, but basically Priya says that trans persons should be able to shower separately. They should uh, be able to, uh, they have a right to be searched and communicated with respectfully, and that being trans or gay, uh, anywhere in the LGBT or intersex um, identity would be a criteria for vulnerability. That's basically it. Uh, a lot of people think PREA actually provides more protections than it does, but they're pretty limited. Um, PREA says that you are not allowed to 
house persons solely on the basis of genitalia, but all they have to do to comply with that is to say, we don't house persons on the basis of genitalia. We take several things into consideration, and you're PREA compliant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's, again, there's not a lot of teeth to that. Um, and as I said, there's uh, out of possibly a thousand trans persons in just the Texas system, we only know of one who is in a gender affirming uh, unit and she has had bottom surgery. Oh, so, okay. So, that, kind so of that's why the exception yeah. that proves the point. Right, right. right. And so, you know, earlier you were talking about folks, you know, having to jump over incredibly severe hurdles just to get hormones. So, I mean, speaking generally about the state of medical care for trans folks, I mean, I, I have to imagine that's just generally a pretty nightmarish thing. Yeah. It's been said in Texas that the entire Texas system is probably in violation of the Eighth Amendment for its horrible medical care. We work with somebody who's not trans, who has a hernia that they say measures 23 centimeters long, and they're not being treated. Um, we work with a trans woman who had a seizure not long ago, and she fell and hit a cabinet and broke her, the facial bones. Um, I'm not sure uh, what... I don't remember the specific scientific terms, but it's part of her facial structure beside her nose so that her jaw is actually moving up and down when she eats. Oh. And all they did was x-ray her. Um, it's, I'm getting confused. Uh, I'm getting contradictory uh, reports on whether much can be done about that kind of fracture, but that's the kind of thing where they try to just push that aside and not treat it. Um, but when we step in and we write letters and things that forces them to be a little bit more accountable. Um, so yeah, healthcare is pretty, pretty bleak. Uh, and I think that's true not only in Texas, but in most states, uh, in Texas, at least we do have hormone access and several states do still have a freeze frame policy. So, um, I believe it was, Earlier this year, maybe Alabama, I can't remember for sure which state, um, may have been Alabama, uh, a dozen trans women were advocating for an end to the freeze frame policy, and they finally got that. What's a freeze frame policy? Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Freeze frame policy would say that you can have access to hormones if you were on hormones before. So oh, okay. you're only allowed to have what... Um, what you were being prescribed when you entered the system. So it essentially is a freeze frame. So if you were not, if you were not, didn't have access to hormones, either due to finances or couldn't find an affirming doctor or whatever, then in the system, you could never have access. And, uh, and you spoke to this a little earlier, but um, I'm interested in hearing more. Obviously, there's a stereotype of police and correctional officers and you know, people in, involved in general in law enforcement generally um, that I, it, I'm guessing it's a mostly accurate one. I don't know that they're largely a conservative and not a super accepting or tolerant or progressive bunch. And so uh, I'm curious if you have stories uh, surrounding uh, policies and practical realities when it comes to uh, people just generally being treated with respect, like people you know having their proper names used, their proper pronouns, that kind of thing. That would be nice. <laughs> that pretty much doesn't exist, yeah. uh, at least not in Texas. Um, we have, um, let's see, it as far as... I can't think of one unit where we have reports that people are actually um, spoken to with proper names and pronouns. In fact, what sometimes happens now is the guards will use Priya um, and around uh, and um, um, training around. Uh, sexual assault and sexual harassment to actually harass trans persons. So what they'll say is, when I mentioned earlier, they will call trans women by sir and mister and trans men, uh, trans men by um, ma'am and ms. They do that and they claim that if they don't do that, 
it's sexual harassment. So they're using <sighs> policy against sexual harassment in order to harass trans persons. Um, in the federal system, they actually wrote into the new uh, trans policy that was issued in January this year, I believe, um, it is not considered sexual harassment to use um, the pronouns and names that a trans person prefers. They had to explicitly put that in the policy in order to identify that as an issue. They don't require people to do it. They said it's your option to do that. Um, more often in, in Texas, we have um, lots of deliberate um, abuses in, in terms of, yes, a conservative uh, background or a conservative mentality um, being, um, I don't know, being part of the mechanism that, that fosters discrimination and harassment. We had at one unit, which kind of has a reputation for trying to be at least gay friendly. They intentionally hire gay guards, uh, gay and lesbian guards there. Uh, earlier this year, we had an issue where one of the guards told actually a gay man we work with, um, all of you trannies and gays need to be lined up and shot in the back of the head. Wow. Um, so that was the kind of thing where as soon as he reported that to us, we sent it out to... Um, by email to the different offices to say this needs to be investigated as a threat against somebody's life. Um, they just excuse it and say it didn't happen. Of course. But um, that kind of thing does happen. Um, it's seldom proved. It's right. basically the way it works is when you report something like that, um, the investigators will go ask the accused person and say, hey, this person over there, they said you said this. Did you say that? I said, no, I didn't say that. Okay, well, that's, that's unsubstantiated. It didn't happen. And so they've done two things. One is they, they denied the uh, accusation, but they also outed the person that turned it in <sighs> to get them in more trouble. Wow. I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but God. <laughs> when when that happens in sex assault cases, which is very common, mm -hmm. that can cause a lot of trouble. Yeah. Um, and recently we've had cases where, especially for trans persons, um, I don't know if it's because our data set is mainly trans persons, or if this happens to everybody who's turning in sex assault cases, but something we've seen this year where we haven't seen it in prior years was when somebody reports a sex assault, uh, a sexual assault, then they'll do a, the kind of basic write off investigation and that gets the person in trouble. But then if the, the person then files, say, files a grievance against the investigation not being done properly, they'll be called into an office and they'll ask, be asked to give a statement. They give a statement insisting that the sexual assault happened, but because it's been found unsubstanti unsubstantiated, they cite them with a disciplinary case for lying during an investigation. <laughs> oh, God. And... <laughs> and that's the kind of thing that like I always I always um, my general nature is to try and give people the benefit of the doubt and just think that like a lot of this stuff is ignorance and it's uh, you know good intentions gone wrong and that kind of stuff and that's the kind of thing that's just like nope sorry the cynical the cynical part of me is true like this is intentional and the system <laughs> is specifically set up this way uh, to to protect we, the people in power <laughs> like <laughs> exactly we have. Um, a number of people and at first I was like I don't really know if I believe this but this has come from so many people who don't know each other and it seems so common where somebody will turn in a, um, 
a request for an investigation about a physical assault or a sexual assault or harassment or something, they'll be called into a private office where they'll be harassed to withdraw their complaint. And basically, they'll be threatened with retaliation. These things happen out of camera sight. And so there's no proof. And a lot of people will recant because they know the people in charge have the power to um, get them in a lot of trouble. Um, so that's called uh, cooperating. So if somebody writes to us and said, oh, no, uh, Leanne cooperated, we know that that means she recanted her um her report of something happening against her and went with what the the administration wants the official story to be god so okay. america home <laughs> of the free right right god so so obviously the state of things is pretty bad so um starting to round out the interview here i would love to hear about some of the victories that you've had or uh, or uh, you know other organizations just general victories that you've had in in pushing things forward and actually trying to make things better in situations like these please say there's at least one thing that has happened <laughs> right. just make one up if you have to <laughs> yeah i think there are some things that we've done um for us, one of the first things we did was get rid of those trips to the psych units. So that was really positive. People no longer have to go through that aspect. They go through a television interview now in their unit. And so they've actually, the medical contractor, it seems has actually hired somebody specifically to work with the trans persons because she's doing all of these television interviews now. So I think that's, that's something good. Um, the, uh, we had one person who was actually denied hormones and we had worked with her for a long time and it was pretty certain that she is trans. There's just, I may doubt some other people, their, their motivation for starting hormones. We always accept somebody's story. But for her, no, there's no doubt. And she was actually denied for a really bad reason. Um, and we got them to reverse that. And actually, I think that it seems to, to be that that changed their policy of how they evaluate people as well. So I think that made the system more accountable to doing things at least fairly um, and other organizations. I think this is something we're seeing is that we're working with other organizations like black and pink and Austin, ABC, Austin anarchist, black cross to kind of work together. Um, like when there was the flooding in, uh, excuse me, along the Texas coast this year, Austin Anarchist Black Cross, Houston Anarchist Black Cross, both work together to get data for the National Lawyers Guild. And then since we have a good connection with Anarchist Black Cross, uh, with Austin Anarchist Black Cross, we help them send out their surveys to people we had connections with that they didn't. And so we kind of coordinate together sometimes and building that network really increases your effectiveness and it makes people in power uncomfortable. And so we see that kind of outside the walls. But one thing that I think has really surprised me that I think is, is I don't know, it makes me feel really good is the amount of community we're seeing being built inside the walls of people helping each other out inside the walls. Because before, trans persons were like totally on their own inside. And you didn't see a lot of people working together. Now there's information being shared. When people go on, uh, trans are transferred between units, they run across each other and they'll trade information. Uh, we've got, we work with three or four people who are writing suits. And so we're helping them to gather information. Uh, we've been collecting information for some problems at this one unit from multiple people. Uh, and we've got a connection on the inside that's feeding us information so that we can try to address the issues uh, system, uh, you know, unit wide in this case. Um, so things like that. Yeah, I think there are some some positive things, especially in terms of movement building that are happening. 
Good stuff. And so for, you know, for all of us, what are some practical ways that we can get involved if, uh, you know, we're, we're just now figuring this out and we want to do something about it? What are some practical ways that we can get involved and help? Well, I think one thing that anybody can do is just learn about prison issues, learn about the abolition movement and what abolition actually means, because it doesn't always mean abolishing the whole system right away. It means looking toward making changes to treat people humanely, uh, learn about restorative justice and uh, taking accountability, our own accountability for security so we we lessen that dependence on the carceral system and lessen that dependence on um, the, the calling the police for the neighbor that turns their music up too loud. Those are kind of really basic things that really is needed to kind of increase the understanding of why prison issues are trans issues. Um, you can also get a pen pal. Black and Pink has an online database of folks and it's 13,000 individuals looking for pen pals and you can you can def- filter this database so that you can look for trans persons in your state um, write to somebody and that way you get a personal connection to experiences within the system and you get to help somebody um, find out what your local organizations are doing around prison abolition and get involved because there's not too many trans specific organizations that are working on prison issues, but there are quite a few prison activist uh, organizations from, uh, you can look at the prison activist resource center or critical resistance or look for black and pink chapters, anarchist black cross chapters and the incarcerated workers organizing committee chapters. All of those are I've been surprised how welcome trans persons are within the prison abolition movement. So all of those are going to welcome trans activists into their chapters. And I think you'll be surprised at how well you're welcomed. So those are some things I would suggest that pretty much anybody could do. Good stuff. And to wrap it up, uh, tell us where we can find more about the work that you do with your organization. Where can we go online to find out what you're doing? Oh, we have a website called uh, tpride.org trans pride initiative tpride.org and uh, so that's our site you can look around there and see a little bit of what what we do we're also on facebook and instagram and twitter all right well now thanks so much for coming on this is super informative and uh i uh, i, I want to do an episode about prison abolition later on so or, or abolition later on so i'll be in touch because that's a subject that i'm interested in too <laughs> Well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this topic. That, my friends, is going to do it for this episode of the Gaytheist Manifesto. We are a proud member of the Trans Podcaster Visibility Initiative. We're a group of trans podcasting badasses working to bring more trans voices into podcasting and other content creation. Search for the Trans Podcaster Visibility Initiative on Facebook for more info. You can find our show on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Gaytheist Manifesto. You can email us at the Gaytheist Manifesto at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter at Gaytheist Callie. You can find the show on Twitter at the Gaytheists. Well, I have some bad news and some good news. The bad news is that I kind of dropped the ball and I didn't write an outro for this week. But the good news is that I have the recipe here for how to write an outro. So I I think I could just read that. And if people want to make their own outro at home, then they can just follow this recipe. I think that's a fantastic Uh, idea. So the ingredients you're going to need, you're going to need one cup of breadcrumbs, two tablespoons of melted butter, one pound of vegan procrastination brand meatless crumbles, (laughs) two cups of absurdist humor minced, three eggs, uh, half a cup of chopped internet culture references. Uh, For the best results, you're going to want to use ones that are several years old and were only ever moderately popular at most because they have more of an earthy flavor. Uh, But you can substitute (laughs) new or well-known memes in a pinch. Uh, You also need two tablespoons of salt, 1.5 tablespoons of disappointment extract, and spicy brain to taste. Uh, So your directions, you're going to preheat the oven to approximately the temperature of your soul when you see a cuteness. (laughs) In a large bowl, combine all the ingredients until well mixed. Allow the mixture to set for 10 minutes. Meanwhile, friend Ari Stillman on Facebook or send an email to AriStillman4 at gmail.com. Forget what you were doing and start watching a YouTube video where people from one country try snacks from another country and rate them on a scale from 1 to 10. Get startled when your oven beeps to let you know that it's hot. 
Grease out a large pan and smooth the mixture inside it. Bake for the length of an episode of the scissor getting out of hand. This is important. Do not substitute it for the SJW circle jerk as doing so may cause an unpleasant bitter aftertaste. Remove from the oven and cool for 20 minutes before your partner decides that they would rather go out to eat because we never do anything romantic anymore. Spend 30 (laughs) minutes browsing Yelp and suggesting places while your partner shoots all of them down but does not offer any alternatives. Snack on the finished food product while your partner waffles endlessly. Continue in this cycle forever and never eat a proper meal ever again. And that's how you write an outro. If you want to support the show and the activism we do, you can head to patreon.com slash the Gatheist Manifesto and make a per episode donation as little as a dollar per episode. You can also head over to iTunes and give us a five star review that helps us get heard by more people, helps us move up in the rankings and so on. Before we go, I want you to know that if you're lost, you're hurting, you're scared, if you feel like no one cares and no one understands, you need to know there's a community out here that loves you, cares for you, knows that you're capable of amazing things and that you are worthy of love. If you're struggling, please don't be afraid to reach out. Until next time, friends, this is the Gatheist Manifesto.